At the heart of what we do is exploring limitless possibilities to enrich lives all over the world. Life is precious and we are in the business of cherishing every precious heartbeat. Every day brings a new reason to better our lives. Something to learn. Something to laugh and enjoy. Something to dream. For as long as there's a dream, there's hope. And as long as there's hope, there's joy in living. Reasons for us to keep every heart happy and healthy. Helping us in our endeavor are the many interventional cardiovascular solutions that we create. At our state-of-the-art facilities, we make our stents and catheters. Wires and needles. German excellence and Indian innovation backed by credible research. With the unmatched advantage of being the only company with clinical trials data spanning over 10 years for efficacy and safety. And a one of its kind partnership with the German Heart Center, renowned for its pioneering advancements in cardiovascular technologies. It's not surprising we have over 5,000 satisfied clients and a million smiling patients in over 50 countries around the world. We trust good things happen when you follow your heart because there's an ocean of opportunities to discover. And our journey has just begun. Translumina. Exploring limitless possibilities of life. Hi, uh, good evening to all the uh, to all viewers um, in India and abroad. Um, a great opportunity. First of all, let me welcome the elite panel sitting here, and at the same time, the valuable viewers all over the part of the country. Um, come COVID, um, uh, we got a new learning a way of learning opportunity and a learning platform, and that gave us a new name called BIC Best of Intervention Cardiology Cases 2020. We thought uh, your love and affection allowed us to take us to newer heights and we thought it to take this at a more regional level and we took this at the regional level and to bring that focus of learning and sharing on this platform and today is uh, we started this journey uh, just up 15 days back from Maharashtra and today is a great moment for us that we are doing a simultaneous learning opportunity at extreme south at Tamil Nadu chapter and the eastern chapter in eastern part of the country. It's a pride moment for all of us. We welcome you all. In order to take this learning forward, today I have a privilege of introducing the moderator of the session who will take this forward. Let me introduce the moderator of the day, Dr. Shrikant Sethi. He is a senior intervention cardiologist and head of the department at Sakra Hospital at Bangalore. Uh, just to talk about his medical acumen, he is known to open CTOs very effectively. But when it comes to human side, he is a very patient-centric doctor. And no wonder he has been awarded by a Nanda Prabhu Kempegora Award of Medicine. So over to you, Dr. Srikant Sethi, for this wonderful session to take this forward and do invite the chair and the co-chair and the speakers to make it a great learning platform to all of you and all of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Esanji. Uh, thank you for your uh, kind words of introduction. Good evening, everybody. I have uh, this uh, privilege of uh, moderating this session and uh, introducing uh, some of my very uh, senior and esteemed uh, colleagues. And uh, to start off, uh, I have the privilege of introducing none other than Dr. Nakul Sina, uh, a great teacher who has uh, trained scores of uh, cardiologists who are practicing across the country and across the world. In his uh, long and uh, esteemed uh, career, uh, he has been a professor and head of the Department of Cardiology at uh, SGPJ Lucknow. And he is currently the Director of Interventional Cardiology at uh, Medanta Hospital, uh, Lucknow. Sir, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Uh, 
and my privilege to welcome you. I also have the uh, thank you, uh, uh, inviting our uh, co-panelists, uh, Dr. Aftab Khan, senior interventional cardiologist from Apollo Hospital, Kolkata, Dr. Animesh Mishra, head of the Department of Cardiology at uh, NEG RIMS Hospital, Shillong, Dr. Rituparna Barwa, head of the Department of Cardiology at Apollo Hospital, Gauhati, and Dr. P. K. Hazra, Departmental Head Cardiology at Apollo Hospital, Gauhati. So I'm sure that uh, today we will have a lot of exciting uh, presentations uh, from which uh, all of us can learn. Now, shockwave lithotripsy uh, has uh, revolution revolutionized the treatment of uh, uh, difficult to treat calcified uh, coronaries. I would like uh, uh, Dr. Sina to give some uh, uh, chairperson's remarks. Uh, first of all, a very good afternoon to all of you. I hope I am audible and clear. So, as I please said, the sun rises in the east. So, I think this is very appropriate that perhaps the first or second session is the start of the east. And we are going to see a lot of rising suns in the form of interesting cases. I see Dr. Hazra here who every time comes up with some surprises or the other. And I see a lot of other friends like Dr. Animesh Misra, and I'm sure others are also going to join in here. And of course, I put up Shikan for some time. And uh, although now traveling is a uh, question perhaps even for the next one year, but I hope that we're going to meet more frequently just like this. So that's not a bad option at all. So Dr. Shikant, you may perhaps go ahead with the program because I don't want to lose a lot of time. And uh, we would request all the presenters to slightly, uh, tightly limit the time so that there's more opportunity for discussion. Yes. Thank you so much, sir, for your valuable comments. We will start the program with the first presentation from Dr. Rituparna Barua. Uh, he is going to present a case of uh, IVL. Can an IVL done be without done without coronary imaging? Dr. Barua, please. Is it visible? Uh, my slides? Yes, yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and regards to my senior and, uh, and your faculty members. So in my lab, actually, there is uh, unavailability of the uh, coronary imaging. And then... To put on, make it a slideshow? Yeah. Make it larger? Slideshow, yeah. OK, go ahead. And uh, this is a case uh, I opted to do a uh, highly classified trump track type classification. And uh, the patient actually presented with uh, anstemi, and uh, she is a 65 years old lady, uh, diabetic, hypertensive, and presented with acute LVF. And uh, troponin I was 4,000, and uh, uh, she was uh, settled down with uh, conservative management initially, and then took up for uh, coronary angiogram. And uh, for the uh, Limitation of the time, I just want to show this uh, left system angiogram. And uh, this is heavily calcified uh, LA dilation. And patient uh, in the echocardiography, we have uh, seen walmost abnormality in the uh, LAD territory, and the ejection fraction was 45%. And after taking all the consent, and then I took up for the uh, angiogram first. And I actually uh, did stage procedure because at the time I didn't have the IVL facility uh, in my cat lab. So this is the angiogram showing um, highly calcified uh, LED. And then plan was to doing uh, uh, angioplasty uh, from LED to left main. And uh, the case uh, once doing, and then uh, I first try to prepare the bed and because it is the most essential part of uh, negotiating the IVL uh, catheter, IVL balloon inside the coronary artery. We dilated it to by a 10 millimeter balloon and then the sequential dilatation with 2.5 uh, uh, NC balloon. 
and this is uh, after uh, doing 2.5 NC billion, we have found, we have seen some resection also, but uh, the patient uh, was asymptomatic, and uh, and but uh, I thought that at this point uh, I will be able to negotiate the IVL uh, balloon. Uh, I have taken uh, three 12 uh, shockwave uh, balloon. And at this point, I thought that uh, there is critical stenosis in the diagonal also. And then before uh, just uh, fear of zeoparding this uh, diagonal, I thought there's some dilatation, balloon dilatation with a two 10 millimeter balloon done at the ostium of the diagonal. And you can see the very highly calcified uh, LED. And uh, after doing the IVL uh, three uh, uh, by 12 millimeter, I, 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 I was able to negotiate in the coronary artery LED and then uh, eight uh, cycles of uh, shockwave uh, completed, and then I have done sequential shockwave, uh, three shockwave in the LED, uh, proximal to mid segment, and also in the uh, left main. Also, that uh, Cine is not available here, and then uh, I tried to deploy this stand. My I was scared of uh, not expanding this stand fully, but uh, uh, interestingly, uh, this stand expanded very well after uh, doing the IVL. This is my first experience of IVL, and I was surprised to see that how well this uh, stand expanded. And this is a 348 millimeter uh, giant's uh, stand first deployed uh, mid to distal segment of the LED. And then uh, another stand, 3.5 uh, 48 uh, millimeter, was deployed. Uh, Overlapping the mid to distal LED stand to left main ostium. And there is sequential NC dilatation uh, with a 3 by 15 millimeter balloon uh, in the distal stand, and then sequential dilatation with 3.5 by 15 millimeter balloon uh, in the uh, proximal stand. And then uh, uh, I, I dilated, I took a 4 uh, 12 millimeter balloon and then dilated the proximal part of the LED along with uh, to the left main ostium. And finally, I took 4.5 millimeter, uh, 4.5 to 12 millimeter balloon and dilated the uh, left main along with the left main ostium. And this is the uh, this is the cine after 4.5 millimeter dilatation of the uh, uh, left main. And this is the final picture of the LED. And then I was. Very happy that seeing this stand expansion in that uh, highly calcified trump tech uh, type of calcification. And uh, I have used 348 millimeter and 3.5 38 millimeter stand covering the ostium of the left main to the distal part of the LED and their sequential dilatation of the uh, stands uh, uh, with uh, 3, 3 millimeter and 3.5 and uh, went up to 4.5 by 12 millimeter in the left main ostium. And uh, finally, I uh, got a very good result of Dimitri flow. This is uh, the first case I wanted to show, and the, I have another case. This is uh, another uh, uh, patient of 64 years, male patient, and this, this was a CKD patient. The creatinine was five, and uh, uh, and he was on. Uh, maintaining hemodialysis, and he's a diabetic, and then patient presented with acute coronary syndrome, uh, and STEMI, and his exome fraction was 40%, and the ISX surgery was uh, severely uh, hypokinetic. And this patient, and the left system, there is a grossly calcified uh, LED and LCX, and, and uh, after wiring the LCX, and then first try to dilate it with two 12 millimeter balloon, and then the sequential dilatation with uh, 2.5 NC balloon, uh, just to make a basis so that I can uh, take up the uh, IVL uh, balloon. This is the IVL balloon uh, shockwave uh, balloon of uh, two, 2.5 12 millimeter, and in the LCX. Uh, uh, distal to the proximal, uh, I have given uh, finished up the eight cycles of the shock wave, 
and then after that i took up uh, 2.5 uh sorry 3 mm uh, nc balloon and then sequential dilatation to the distal to the proximal part and then uh, it was nice to see that the balloon expanded quite well after the shock wave and then we negotiated the stand uh, to the lcx uh, uh, with a, a guide gajila and uh, because uh, i found some difficulties while negotiating this stand i thought initially that it might be difficult to plan was the bifurcation stand but i thought that it might be difficult to uh, do a bifurcation because the l6 ostium is too calcified i may not be able to negotiate the stand so i thought that uh, we'll just try to stand the uh, l6 to the ostium and then we can make it a reverse step uh, uh, kind of uh, left main bifurcation standing so this is the first stand placed in the l6 it is quite uh, well expanded and then i uh, took the uh, another three ivl balloon and then uh, give uh, shock waves to the left main because left main ostium and to the mid sub cross the calcified and then we dilated with a, a balloon 3 to 3.5 and this stand was placed it was uh, 3.5 to uh, 26 uh, mm long to the from the ostium to the to overlap the uh, uh, to the uh, led proximal part and there was sequential dilatation of the uh, left main stand uh, to the led with a 3.54 and finally uh this and then finally kissing was done and this is the final uh, injection of the left main after a bifurcation stand so nice results was found according to angiogram because i don't have the coronary imaging facility so the luminogram is the only choice i was having so i thought that uh, it is uh, uh, maybe the best results as far as uh, subject to the availability of the infrastructure so thank you for your uh, attention great cases uh, dr barwa thank you for your presentation i invite uh, comments from uh, dr sina and our other esteemed panelists unmute yourself sir dr sina yeah fine so i think dr randeep's presentation mainly focuses as to whether and how far are we just to find going ahead with an ibl without imaging and seeing and quantifying the calcium as best as possible so i think i'd like to reserve the comments at this point of time because see many a time imaging may not be available may not be working and the uh, we need to take a decision by seeing the angiographic calcium but then it's very difficult to sort of have an eyeballing view and decide that the calcium is so heavy enough to need an ibl because many a times you can get away with a plain nc balloon dilatation and a high pressure stent dilatation without using an ibl which we are doing for the last so many years ibl is an addition for the last one or two years only so uh, well i think the there is a possibility that we may land up in some unpleasant situations but yes many a times i think we can get away with it so i would like to hear the comments of other moderators and panelists yeah ritupurna i think in the first case uh, yes. using ivl is advantageous because it do not produce any kind of dissection proximal or distal so you have a controlled kind of dilatations with ivl but my question is if you do not have imaging do you have any physiology if you have physiology and if you have a pull back on the ifr or kind of some kind of core registration with ifr or qfr or rfr you could have avoided the proximal stand if you had a normal ifr after fixing the distal uh, stand with ivl 
So what has happened where you have a full metal jacket of the LED in the first case. Second case, again, doing uh, LED without IFR, RFR, I think uh, it should be more, uh, I mean, more uh, careful using uh, just uh, visual guesstimations. The guesstimations uh, works, but does not work in 2020. Don't take it as a, uh, I mean, um, a strong criticism, but that is my observation. Over to you. Yes, sir. Actually, I took up these cases because these two patients presented with acute coronary syndrome. And then, uh, these are obviously, there's a high risk and highly classified, and there is obviously the need of the uh, physiology and the imaging. But considering the risk and the patient presented with the MI, and then after after talking to the attendants with all the possible risk, and then uh, I just uh, went ahead and uh, did it. But uh, fortunately, uh, I feel that you know, the results is so. Uh, uh, is okay, but uh, uh, your points are very well taken. Sir. Yeah, another thing, uh, this is Dr. Aftab here, uh, Dr. Rikupan, again, wonderful cases. My only concern was in that the second case, you used a three uh, balloon, uh, you used a three millimeter IV in the, in the left main, uh, which I feel is a little bit of a, a I mean, we need to normally size our IV at least one is to one. Uh, so three I millimeter IV in, uh, in the in left main. I, I have taken 3.5 IV. Was for the LED and the right. So, and I would agree with uh, Dr. Hazra because I think uh, we now have enough data to say that um, when you, because uh, see, I think uh, with these calcific lesions, I think we all know that uh, an unexpanded stent is the is the is the most common indicator for acute stent thrombosis. And if you don't expand your stents well and adequately, uh, which is often seen well on imaging, uh, we are likely to end up with uh, acute events. Uh, so, all uh, with due, to, I mean. Uh, with all great respect to the fact that you're working in a place where we don't have the all facilities, I think uh, the the bottom line should be that uh, uh, the message should be that yes, if you're tackling these complex cases, it is always advisable to have some form of imaging because that I think definitely improves outcomes. And uh, using an imaging uh, at the beginning of the procedure might help you to decide uh, your strategy in terms of whether you are going to use an ultra high pressure balloon versus. Uh, IVL versus uh, uh, rotablation, particularly because if uh, if you have less than uh, uh, let's say uh, 240 degrees um, calcium arc of calcium, then maybe you can break it with a uh, uh, open NC as well and not depend on uh, IVL to do it. So uh, you you can choose between an expensive therapy versus a not so expensive uh, therapy. So. It helps you to also decide uh, what atherectomy you're going to do uh, to begin with. Uh, but great results. Are there any more comments about this case from the panel? You can go to the next case. Yes, sir. So now I invite uh, Dr. Aftab uh, to present the case of IVL in a left main bifurcation. Uh, Dr. Rituban has to stop sharing his slides, I believe. Okay, he stopped his share screen. Okay. Uh, uh, so again, I'm presenting another case of an IVL in a left main uh, intervention. Uh, this is a gentleman, an elderly gentleman uh, with hypertension and uh, dyslipidemia. And with uh, CKD, his EGFR was 35 ml with a creatinine of 1.8. And uh, he had chronic stable angina for the last many years. But uh, even though he's 76, he's an active gentleman. And now recently he had started having crescendo angina. He has a, a whitish prolonged PR with a right bundle branch block, though his echo is well preserved. Uh, so this gentleman was taken up for an angiogram, and uh, this was an angiogram done earlier, and which showed a distal left main lesion. Uh, you can see that the uh, there is a proximal circumflex lesion, and the distal LED has good targets and uh, not 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 much of disease depth. So it's usually the osteoproximal and the distal left main and the osteoproximal lesion the, in the uh, circumflex and the ramus. Another view showing the proximal tight critical lesion in the distal left main. And you can appreciate that there is an angiographic calcium there. I'm not sure if it's visible in these slides there, but yes, there is definitely angiographic calcium that is visible here. And the same in the spider view, it shows the, uh, the trifurcation lesion, uh, the distal left main, osteal LED, osteal, uh, osteal uh, ramus, and uh, there's a proximal circ lesion. Uh, and this is RCA was uh, disease-free. 
So we now had uh, two options with us. Now we had this gentleman who had an elderly gentleman with a distal left main disease with significant calcium. His syntax score was 28 and a Euro score was six. Now we had these options of CABG with his PCI. And the pros of a CABG were that uh, we could achieve a complete revascularization and therefore give him a better long-term result. It would also be a cost-effective treatment for him. The cons were the fact that he has a CKD and also the fact that the patient and his family were pretty against uh, for any open surgical procedure. Uh, the pros of a PCI was, yes, we could do this procedure. And we had a patient who was more than willing to go for an angioplasty. The cons were the fact that we had an angiographically visible calcium. And uh, we all uh, know that a stent in under expansion is something that can be fatal, especially in this location that we're talking about. And we also knew that this gentleman had a creatinine of 1.8 uh, stage 3 CKD, and uh, we could worsen his nephropathy thanks to our contrast inter with the interventions. So we had a hard team approach, and we offered him CABG as the first option. And uh, he did finally agree to CABG, and the patient had a surgery with a lima to LED and a vein graft to OM. He had a stormy post-op course with a prolonged I2 stay and uh, had some leads also, but eventually was discharged two weeks after surgery. Well, uh, six months post-surgery, he again presented with rest angina. His nephropathy had not really worsened dramatically, but his ECG now started showing resting changes in the uh, anterior leads now. His echo EF also dropped a bit uh, from 60% to now 50%. The only fortunate part was that despite uh, the fact that he had post-operative bleed uh, during his uh, first uh, post-CABG course. He did not have further GI bleed thereafter. And uh, he was then taken up for an angiography because of worsening the uh, rest symptoms with a view to revascularization. So this was his angiogram again with similar pictures was there for his uh, CABG on back, except for the fact that possibly his circumflex lesion has become a bit tighter. And uh, thanks to the flow in the lima, Uh, the other arteries were almost similar to the one that was there six months back. And uh, uh, his right coronary artery was still preserved. Uh, his lima graft had closed, and that was the reason for his worsening of his symptoms, as also his venous graft to the OM. Uh, so this poor gentleman had all his grafts, both his grafts closing off. <laughs> so the options that we had was to send him for a redo CABG. Uh, or do an I was, I mean, do a PCI. Uh, the patient after his first failed CABG was quite reluctant this time to go for a CABG, and the surgeon was also pretty reluctant with his age and his nephropathy status to take him up for another procedure. <coughs> uh, we decided to go for a PCI, but we decided that it had to be image guiding, and we had to do some form of debulking in the Austin of the, of the LAD uh, with the calcium there. So the, it was a radial approach. We took a seven French uh, guide, and uh, the fact that we had an imaging option between an OCT and an IVIS, uh, we uh, are probably in our uh, clinical experience, I feel that probably an OCT gives us a better idea of the depth of calcium uh, as compared to an IVIS, because IVIS then produces a shadowing, which makes it difficult for us to know how deep your calcium is. Whereas an OCT can give you an idea about how deep your calcium is and how, uh, uh, what is the width of your calcium also. The only issue was that in this patient, OCT with a contrast would mean additional contrast load. And as this patient already had CKD, I decided to go ahead with OCT with saline. Now, this is something that we can discuss at the end and uh, Dr. Hazra and um, the others uh, who are there. Well, uh, there have been papers which are presented with uh, saline contrast also. And uh, this is something that we found quite useful in patients where we want to restrict the contrast load. There is a little uh, buy-off that you get in terms of your uh, imaging. Uh, there are certain image uh, certain uh, runs which will be clinically non-usable, and you may have to repeat them. But in terms of uh, the other things, in terms of uh, visualizing your lesions or visualizing your stent opposition, there's not much of a difference. There is a little problem in terms of diameter. So if you're doing a diameter calculation as compared to with saline OCT as compared to contrast, there is a little lesser sizing. So there's a little undersizing as compared to saline contrast uh, OCT as compared, uh, saline con uh, induced OCTs as compared to contrast OCTs. And there's a correction factor then one may need to use if at all uh, one needs to get the exact size. So this uh, gentleman then uh, had a pre dilatation of the proximal lesion done. And then I did an OCT run in the LED and in the circ. Uh, so this was a run which was from the left main from the LED into the left main, and for uh, time constraints, I'll just pull it down 
uh, to the areas of interest. So this is a lesion here where you can see at uh, say 12 o'clock to three o'clock position, you can see the calcium uh, that is there. There's the uh, shadowing there with, with uh, sharp margins. And again, uh, they can also see another calcium spur, which is seen, uh, this is deep calcium, which is not a spur, but this is deep calcium that is seen again between 10 to 12 clock position. And again, there's a calcium which extends all the way around the arc and you can see another uh, calcium, which is again from say 12 o'clock to, or nine o'clock to almost a three o'clock position. So this was a long run of calcium and it was involving an arc. And uh, this is again from the LMC, uh, from the circumflex to the LMCA. And again, uh, when we did a pullback here, uh, there was an area of interest here, which uh, showed the presence of a thrombus here. So this is a thrombus and this is a red thrombus as compared to a white thrombus. Why red thrombus? Because the white thrombus usually does not produce this attenuation in the distal part that you see. Whereas a, white, a red thrombus, uh, because of the blood, rest, blood cells that uh, block the, blood, uh, the flow uh, blow of uh, block the transmission of light would give an attenuation under the thrombus. So there's a thrombus in the circumflex, which also is possibly responsible for the acute lesions, uh, acute symptoms that this gentleman is having. Now, this is a scoring system that I think all of us are now aware of. And you look at the arc of calcium and you look at the uh, the, the uh, depth of calcium and the length of calcium. And this gentleman had a long arc and he had a long lesion and he also had a thick calcium where lithotripsy was the treatment of choice. Uh, this was not a balloon undilatable or an uncrossable lesion where I would have tried to use a, a rotablation. Sometimes these therapies are complementary, as Dr. Shetty said, you may have to use a NC balloon and then get your lithotripsy down, or you may have to use a rotablator and then get your lithotripsy balloon down or you, after an IVL, you may have to use an opian balloon to get an adequate result. So these are not uh, sort of, a, uh, these are all complementary therapies and it's ideal to have all these therapies in your lab before you attend these cases. So this is a 3.5 uh, IVL that I used in the left main first, but this gentleman had a critical lesion and he was not behaving very stable during the balloon inflation. And so initially I started with short pulses of five to six seconds and eventually you could go up to 10 seconds per pulse in the LED uh, from the distal left main. And here you can see that the, the lesion in the uh, proximal LED sometimes takes a little longer to open up uh, the, the calcium there. And with the remaining uh, calcium, that uh, the remaining pulses that I had, I gave a few pulses in the ostium of the circumflex also, though there was no significant calcium noted here on the OCT run that I saw there. Well, this was the post, uh, uh, OC, post IVL uh, uh, image. And again, uh, I did another run of uh, OCT there. And uh, it again uh, shows these cracks that you normally see uh, post uh, IVL. And you can see this crack in the uh, intima running down into the, into the calcific plug there. And here also you can see that there is a good uh, crack that is being created by the IVL balloon. A post dilatation was then done in the, in the proximal LED. And then I stented from the left main to the LED and they stented the distal part also. Did a proximal plot and then recrossed uh, into the circumflex in a tap technique and uh, finally finished with a, a kissing balloon followed by a final proximal pot with a 5.5 uh, into 8 balloon. So this was the final result that I achieved on angiography. And um, uh, this is the final OCT run that was done. And again, I'll just pull it across and you can see that the stent has been well opposed. And uh, you can see that the stent in the distal mid part of the LED and here there's a double layer of the stent where that's the overlap segment in the uh, proximal LED and you can see that the, the stent has been, you can see the calcium there outside and the lumen has opened up pretty well and uh, this gave us a good MLA uh, in the left main and in the LED. And similarly our run done was done from the uh, circumflex and here since you realize that this was done with the uh, uh, saline imaging rather than the contrast imaging, you could, this was a place where you could get the contrast, the, uh, the blood was not really cleared well but here it was not an area of interest for us. You could just see the stent struts which are well opposed and therefore I did not repeat another uh, run here. You can see certain areas where the images are not really the optimal, but since this was a post run, uh, I did not spend too much time to do another run here, but the image shows that the opposition of the stent has been adequate. So this is how we started off and this is the result that we got there. Uh, so the learning points I thought was that the OCT was uh, definitely essential to help us to identify the location, the extent of calcification. And in this patient with a CKD, uh, probably a saline injected OCT images were equally good. There are certain limitations, but I think it helped us to restrict the number of, uh, the amount of contrast that we gave him and thereby prevent uh, contrast into his nephropathy. IVL in this case did simplify the procedure. It 
was easy for me to keep a wire in the circumflex during either to from left main to LED. Something that we may not be able to do when you're doing a rotor, uh, you may not be able to protect your side branch there. And again, as uh, Dr. Hasra also said, said, we could prevent extensive dissection uh, by use of an IVL, something that a non-compliant balloons or a scoring balloon sometimes are not able to, uh, to do with us. This patient has been angina free for uh, on a follow for eight months. And uh, I think this is where IVL really helped us uh, to tackle this case, something that would not have been possible in a pre IVL era. So I'll stop my sharing and I'll be open to taking any criticism, comments, or uh, uh, any ideas that could help us in our future cases. Great case, uh, uh, Dr. Aftab. Uh, it is very reassuring and uh, gratifying to see results which can uh, better see a BG in a patient with complex left main bifurcation and a complex clinical subset also because of uh, um, uh, renal dysfunction. I invite uh, comments from the chairperson and the our uh, co-panelists. Uh, after it's Vikash here. Uh, just uh, could you please remind this excellent case actually. It's uh, very nicely done, and uh, thank you for showing this case. Uh, just uh, remind me that uh, you said the criteria of which uh, on the OCT, in which patients the rota will be more suitable compared to in which patients the IVL uh, will be more suitable according to the OCT calcium criteria. Can you just remind me once more, just for my learning? That's one thing. And second thing, second question regarding the saline, uh, um, you know, use in, uh, in OCT picturization. Is there any variation from right coronary artery vis-a-vis left coronary artery, left coronary system? Right. So I'll take the second question first. So as compared to the OCT vis uh, with contrast vis-a-vis -vis OCT with the saline, there's no difference between the right and the left, except for the fact that for the left, we usually use around 15 to 20 ml of uh, hyperonized uh, saline. As compared to the RCA, usually uh, 10 to 15 ml is more than enough. The only difference is, is the in, in vivo sizing of the uh, diameter and the MLAs as compared to contrast. So there's been a study that has been presented by Ziadali and um, uh, the group uh, in, in US, and they've looked at OCT versus saline. It's a small study which they pre presented as an abstract in PCT last year. And uh, what they have said is that the in vivo uh, diameter, when you use a saline as compared to uh, a contrast OCT, the diameters are much lesser in uh, saline uh, images as compared to the contrast images. And they've used a correction factor of 1.05 for a diameter and 1.09 for uh, uh, the ML, uh, MLA uh, uh, when you use saline as compared to that with contrast. So this is a correction factor that one may use if he really wants to get an absolute perfect uh, sizing of an artery, uh, something that may be important in certain situations. So that is one correction factor that they do. Now coming back to which is the criteria where uh, OCT is preferable over, uh, over uh, rotor ablation. So I think in our, I think uh, with all our experience, uh, experienced uh, panelists here, we all know that we've been using rotor all these years, but uh, rotor has a benefit in uh, getting those lesions which are not really crossable. So not balloon crossable lesions or even IVL crossable lesions. You may first need to make a, a passage for your balloon or your uh, IVL to get through. So when you have a long lesion, which is un balloon uncrossable, I think rotor really has a role there and one definitely needs to know how to use rotor and uh, keep as one of its armament, even though we have IVL, which has simplified the techniques a bit more. The arc of calcium. So again, rotor again has beneficial effects when you have an arc. So when you have just a spur of calcium, it sometimes is very difficult to engage the calcium when you have a, a, a calcific spur. Or when you have less than an arc, sometimes it becomes difficult to use, a, 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 to engage with a rotor. So when you have rotor, when you have an arc, even IVL and rotor work equally well when you have an adequate arc. It's the depth of calcium. So when you have a deep calcium, there IVL definitely has a, a better role because it catches, uh, you get uh, much more uh, deeper cracks as compared to rotor. Or when you have um, uh, sort of long lesions where IVL is not, not crossable, I think uh, bal uh, balloon, uh, when IVL is not crossable, your rotor would definitely be an asset there. So when you look at the arc, yes, uh, giving a more arc of almost, two, two, almost 270 degrees, favors both in IVL as well as rota. When you have a long lesion, which is balloon uncrossable, IVL would not be an option there. Rota would have to be done to prepare the lesion first. And if you have deep calcium, probably IVL would have an edge there as compared to rota. Right, Aptar, uh, nice presentation. Uh, if you have Ankush Gupta from Delhi, who presented the saline data in 2020 PCRE course, and he has presented on 118 runs. A good image, as good as uh, contrast is around 
27% is average and 12% is very bad. In the right coronary artery and left coronary artery, right coronary is better, around 70% good image. Left coronary is a 55%. So we have data and uh, what because Mujinder was asking. If you have a calcium nodule, an eccentric calcium, then rota is preferred. Because uh, in Silosa, uh, this algorithm, they mentioned that rota is preferable in this situation. Otherwise, you can go for IVF. Over to Any other comments? So if there are no more comments on this case, thank you, Dr. Afta. It was a great case. We'll go to the next presentation. Do we have Dr. N.N. Kanna? No, sir. I think we can go to doctor. Uh, yeah. So I invite uh, Dr. P. K. Hazra, head of the department, Department of Cardiology from Apollo Hospital, Gauhati. He will be presenting a catastrophe in a caged coronary. Okay. Hi, friends. Uh, uh, I am Dr. Hazra from Calcutta. I'm working uh, in uh, AMRI. Uh, that's a small correction. Oh, in anyway, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so I'll be presenting one case that is very typical uh, to the title. But before going to the cases, you know, it came in 2015 in peripheral. Then in 2018, the coronary came and the numbers are increasing. We have almost 31 countries, more than 20,000 cases and more than 1,500 operators by this time now. It is applicable for eccentric and concentric calcification, but as Silosa algorithm has mentioned, it's more preferable in the concentric, PADs, uh, CLI, CADs, mesentric calcifications, renal calcifications, FEMPOP, infrapop, iliac, CFA, coronary, and there are many applications of these. The two types of balloon, 12 by 2.5 is the minimum size, and 4 by 12 is the coronary, and you can give 10 pulses, I mean, sorry, you can give 8 pulses, of uh, coronary, whereas you can give 300 pulses in the peripheral pulse, peripheral balance is much larger, up to seven, and it is applicable for subclavian, the ileus, common femoral, but below femoral, you have to use smaller size. And it gives almost equivalent to 50 atmospheric uh, compressions to the calcium. And as I said, uh, if you have eccentric lesion, you have to give more cycle. If you have a nodule, perhaps you have to use a two, two IVL catheter. But it's not the ideal one, as I mentioned. There are many devices which can match, which can compete with, but they have some problems. And you know, this uh, uh, IVL is kind of uh, is, is a, a kind of instant breakage of the calcium without much jeopardizing. But OPN is again weightlifting, much of pressure, and it is basically electrical, thermal, mechanical, uh, uh, ultrasonic. Everything is combined, the company itself doesn't know whether it is ultrasound or electrical energy because it does produce some sound and it is based on ultrasound. Now, if you, if you, the one caution that if you are using uh, this IVL for the first time and if you are inflating this balloon without the contrast, immediately balloon will rupture. So, it is my request that if you are using IVL for the first time, follow the guideline, follow the protocol that you have to inflate that core atmosphere, and then only you press the button. Otherwise, it will be total uh, failure. And usually, it is very soft. If you touch this balloon, there will be no uh, current of injury or shocks in your finger, because it, it does respect the soft tissue in the left main, soft tissue in the intima and coronary arteries, but it is hard on hard rocks. So if you have a calcification, which is concentric, whether it is intimal or medial, it works like a wonder, uh, unlike your rotablation. So rotablation is a kind of policy, and it works on the intimal calcification, whereas this IVL works both on intimal and medial calcifications. Uh, that is the difference between uh, choosing rota, and there's a lot of learning curve, and you know the intervascular intertripsy. You don't need anyone to treat you, teach you. The next morning, you can start to operate it. And you know it can be applied even in the valves, aortic stenosis, coronaries, peripheral, and it can reach up to the medial calcifications. And it is like an excess. You are holding this calcium with the parchment-like membrane inside your coronary, inside your aortic uh, aortic valve. So it can see the result. So seeing is believing, 
And once you start doing and do OCT, you will see the wonder. The fracture is much more uh, robust than the, uh, than any cutting balloon or uh, rotablation or uh, other uh, kind of uh, uh, calcium modifications. And there are certain diseases like dialysis, hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia. We get both medial and intimal calcifications. And calcium is the enemy, not only for stain delivery. Uh, you can lose the stain, the stain embolizations, under expansion, stain thrombosis, and long term, long term result drug delivery uh, to the tissue is also becoming a problem. And you know, this uh, score of rule, uh, the rule of 0 0.5, if you have more than 0 0.5 millimeter thickness, more than 0 0.5 centimeter of length, more than 0 0.5 arc of calcium, that will half, almost more than 180 degree, you get two points, and if you have four points, it is preferable to go for IVL or any kind of uh, plaque modification, calcific plaque modification, cutting balloon, OPM balloon. So be prepared with your imaging and these kind of modalities, which are easily available nowadays. No chance of um, distal dissection, distal embolism, whether you do it in peripheral arteries, in the coronaries, and no stain zones, like you have a, a, a superficial humeral artery versus your profunda, you cannot put a stain except superior. And this is the calcium you break in the, in the aortic valve, so it can be applied either internally, even externally. So if you, if you apply external IVL by ultrasonic machine, you have to have higher energy, focus energy, this has already been presented in Europe Asia this time. So it's a modern patient, undoable aortic stenosis. You can break this calcium with you know, PCSK9 inhibitor therapy. Plus, in addition of this, it can do wonder. So this is a case coronary, a case uh, carotid artery, and is a case coronary artery is an ideal one to have this kind of large IVL catheters. There are some advantages and disadvantages as far as the calcium performance is concerned. IVL shock tape is the better. One, because the complications like perforations, the rotor, stack rotor usually are not seen. You don't need any pacing where there's no flow, no slow flow. There is no darling crown. And it can be applied in ISR, bifurcation lesions. If you have a calcium, you put two wires, which cannot be done with your rota or uh, your uh, other, other therapy. So with the same balloon and the same sitting, a six French uh, guiding catheter, will put your IVL in the LED, put your IVL in the diagonal, and you put a stain, and if the bifurcation stain thing, sometimes you do face at the ostium of the bifurcation lesions. Even in CTO, and sometimes the rota fails, you have to combine rota with IVL, or IVL fails, you combine with rota. So rota shocks are also gaining popularity, and sometimes it bridge to tabard, and the shock wave on PTC where I have mentioned. So these are the advantages, and these are the disadvantages. Uh, the complication definitely, but as far as the cost is concerned, in our country, both are uh, costly. I would say uh, rota is less costly now. And uh, it has got uh, a tremendous advantage of time. And many teachers like Professor Nokul Sina, many of our senior teachers, they are quite acquainted with and they have got many students on rota. So we have advantage of time. So pacing, no spacing, but uh, if once you learn doing IVL, the stain passing is so smooth like a butter. And uh, you know, this uh, OCT may not see any crack, even then, even then, your passage of the stain is beautiful and you can see beautiful result. So it's kind of pleasure on the table. Within a five or 10 minutes, you can, you can finish your case. Rota takes a lot of time. Sometimes a larger guiding catheter, you go to the femoral for 1.75 rota. But in the six French, you can pass up to four ml, a four millimeter of rota even in the left main. So pain is a price. And uh, this is the LED, proximal LED. And I would like to thank my, uh, my, uh, my friends from US who has, who has shared some of these slides and also some people from ESC have borrowed and copied. So post IVL, you see some haziness, but this haziness is much uh, uh, less ugly looking than your cutting balloon. And cutting balloon is bulky. This is less bulky. Sometimes you have to dial it. And uh, you see a beautiful picture after you uh, put, a, put a stain. The beauty of IVL is you get the get the vessel motion. So you, uh, you you never ever get this vessel motion back until unless you have bi-absorbable scaffold or a IVL like thing. So if you left with calcium in the media, your vessel becomes a rigid pipe. But IVL can make your calcium so soft and uh, is flaccid so that you put a stent and this stent can bend with the coronary uh, vessel motion. So you get your 
uh, suppleness or vaso motion in proximal uh, left main or, or proximal led ostia or circumflex ostia we will have unprotected left main or when you have a predominant uh, left main system rc small or cto you have to use half cycle that been five pulse then wait for another five pulse and a four to six atmosphere you can go up to 10 atmosphere that is red uh, i been mean rbp for this kind of uh, uh, balloon so non inferior mi covid positive patients i have uh, done one angioplasty about 4 years back he is non diabetic non heavy smoker and that time it was 3.5 mm long stent in the rca and as well as some distal stent there is a gap between proximal stent and distal stent the proximal stent was 3.5 by 38 and is quite nicely visible that time also i understood that uh, he needed some kind of uh, expansion of the stain, but since it was again acute kind of situation, we could not use a rotor that time because of all all uh, thrombotic that time. But this time he has come with severe chest pain, and then there is CTU on the left side, and CTU of the left side is undoable because a small di uh, distal vessel is very small and diffusely disease on the ticket. So I'm concentrating on the right, and this is basically caged coronary artery. You can see you have first the web. And this is the amplazer, so I'm prepared with the stronger guide. And this is usual wear. And this wear, I mean, unlike opium balloon, this balloon can be tracked with simple uh, your uh, normal PTCA wear. But if you want to use opium balloon on caged coronaries, like you have a stain, you have to use a, a grand slam like thing because it's the removal of the wear, the removal of the balloon will be very difficult on the standard PTCA wear. So these kind of wires are not suitable for opium, but it is very suitable. Usual box are suitable. So this uh, 3.5 millimeter uh, IVL, you can see, uh, see there is some uh, dog gunning. So you have exhausted all the pulses of the 3.5 balloon. And uh, even then, I was not very happy anyway. So once you have done that, then you do your uh, usual opium balloon. Then I have dilated with 3.5 millimeter opium balloon. I have ruptured the opium balloon. But I had to fix this artery because he was having severe chest pain, hypotensive, because he is living on single coronary artery almost. Circumference is very small. So I have delivered a 3.5 millimeter stent, though on IVAS it was almost 3.75 or 4 millimeter large vessel. But I thought since I'll be applying two stents and the two metal layers, you know that there is a lot of difference. There are two different animals, 3.5 millimeters and 4 millimeter stent. 4 millimeter stand is much bulkier stand, obviously, because of the larger balloon. But the difference of the start thickness is much higher. Like, for example, you have uh, giants, the 4 millimeter start thickness almost 10 millimeter higher than the 3.5 millimeter uh, stand. So, if you are having two layers, and I'm sure he's going to come back for the third layer when the brachytherapy will work or rota will work. And this time I was looking for a thinner start stand, and that's why I chose a 3.5 millimeter. 3.5 millimeter in the proximal. Again, there is some haziness and some some kind of calcium there, and um, I was not very happy with the with the result. So obviously there was some strain related issue which could be seen on your strain boost. We don't need ultrasound or OCT in these cases. Obviously the strain is underexpanded. On strain boost there was a constriction or there is strain failure or strain failure due to underexpansion of the strain and there was an underlying calcium behind the stent. That is quite obvious on fluoroscopy and stent boost. But for the sake of uh, interest of the time, I mean, I'm not, this is again, uh, this is, again, you can see that it is, again, IVL balloon, 3.5 millimeter, and this is a larger balloon. But this time, this time, I had to, I had to apply a 4 millimeter IVL. So it was kind of uh, 8 lakhs, expenditure stack and uh, luckily i had a four millimeter and 3.5 millimeter agreement i mean consent from the patient party that you may require two balloons so it was four millimeter the only apprehension of using too much of um ivl it may erode the 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 polymer that is only apprehension but there is small study available i do not know but i wanted to have even a bare metal but they let the polymer be eroded but have some lumen gain so on on, I, on angiogram, uh, I had checked with the uh, imaging IVAS that result was good. And uh, this is 52 years male, advanced uh, COPD, acudema, this is non-COVID. And it was kind of uh, a, a CTO, uh, I would say CTO in the proximal AD, though uh, it was not a very difficult case to do in the usual way. 
but I thought there is some calcium and the usual where when it failed to cross that lesion, I thought there must be something, some calcium which is prohibiting the wear passage. So I used some kind of uh, CT wear that, that was a Gaia 2 and this balloon was not crossing. Then I used, uh, I was then I saw some calcium there, They're not a very nice picture. Is not a very, a very uh, huge calcium according to the calcium score. Even that since I'm dealing, dealing with your uh, acute MI, and you know, this post dilatation in acute MI will cause a lot of uh, no flow and deep flow. So I never wanted to have a no flow, deep flow situation in acute coronary syndrome by having non expansion of the stain and I regret. So that was the basic uh, idea of using IVL in this case, 2.5 millimeter IVL. And you, so you see that later on, I know this is a three millimeter IVL, some expansion. How can you how can you identify IVL on this? There is some bubble. If you if you use uh, this IVL, you'll see there's a bubble movement to and fro. That's how you know that it is IVL balloon, not a normal balloon. In normal balloon, this bubble does not move. So in the balloon, if you see the movement, nobody can cheat you that uh, it is IVL. So it has to be IVL if the balloon, uh, this bubble is moving. And there is some dog boning, then you dilate, then proximal, the rest of the case is, is usual, good result you can see. Now, uh, this is kind of thing you can see on, uh, on, 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 on OCT. And you can see that uh, this OCT, if you see the plate of calcium, the tectonic plates of calcium is quite different from the uh, dialysis patient, uh, from your elderly patients, those patients who are on statin. Those who are on high dose of statin, nowadays we are seeing more calcium especially middle-aged diabetic people. CKD, definitely somebody, uh, Apta has shown a case and has mentioned a case. And you have this kind of pictures available. So this is Manamandu Chatterjee. Again, uh, uh, this is obviously visible calcium, proximal LED. And you see this balloon is not expanding. The opium balloon is not expanding. Then you be prepared with your de next device that you can see that a chunk of calcium, but this is eccentric calcium. So rather than wasting IPL, uh, I mean IVL in other segment, please concentrate on the same segment if it is eccentric calcium. In eccentric calcium, you have to give at least this, uh, at least uh, your eight cycles. Sometimes you have to use two balloons. So this one is to one ratio of the actual size, which will do a good job. Like uh, if you have left main four millimeter IVL, if you have a proximal LED 3.5 millimeter, Medial is three millimeter. Rest it can, it depends on the one is to one size. And uh, this Manamendra had uh, one IVL and he had good result. The stent stent passage was so good. I tell you, I, uh, it was uh, much better than uh, than the rota. A rota has got a wire bias. You know, in this eccentric calcium because of the rota wire bias, you may not see uh, good cutting. And uh, sorry, this uh, IVS IVS is not playing. Let me say. Uh, so uh, this kind of unsuccessful, uh, uh, first your one device like your cutting balloon or IVL uh, may not work. So sometimes you have to combine with the rotor and uh, sometimes your rotor does not work. And then you invite IVLs. So this is the rotor shock. This is Gogon Chan. Uh, in the proximal, uh, there was not much of problem, but there was a surprise distally that was some calcium and we put a stain distally that stain was not expanding. So again, it is a caged uh, caged uh, right coronary artery, then we had to open this caged because this is the only energy which will work beyond the stem, like laser. So once you have uh, this kind of situations, previously there was no options, but you have an options now that if, you, if it is under expanded, you can manage this kind of situations, catastrophes in the lab. So ultimately you had, so this is the Slosha OCT algorithm. I'm not going into the detail. Uh, these kind of things you will see and you'll feel happy on the table that opens up suddenly. And if it opens up, you don't have to bother about uh, any other thing. You go ahead with the stenting, your stenting will work. Uh, it can be uh, in CTO, it can be applied in CTO, calcium, I'm not an expert on that. Dr. Uh, Srikant is an expert on that. So this proximal LED, circumflex LED, uh, this left main I have mentioned, you have to be a little uh, careful. Uh, this is half cycle, this eccentric calcium, but this again, one is to one. Peripheral, this is borrowed slides uh, from my friends. Peripheral I have not used. I was planning to do, do one. Femoral artery, Dr. Samin Sarma, last week lecture, he has mentioned if you have two layer of stents, 
if you put a rota it produces heat energy and this distal embolization of the rota diamond chips so this is seen on electron microscopy so those diamond chips are embolized and is sometimes the rota can get stuck so this is another alternative for your uh, double layer and three layer if you have you have to go for brachytherapy so femoral obvious calcification in the lab you can you can do these things the drug delivery now the trend is the drug delivery to the peripheral arteries once you have a good breakage of the calcium your drug or your whatever pactic excellus uh, cerulomas will be delivered to the intima you don't need a stent again if you are planning for taver or your impella in uh, mca sometimes the iliacs are very difficult so you have to have some kind of access this access can be opened up and if you have iv a large iv 7 minute iv and there is a chance of less perforations and less complications with this kind of uh, this kind of so carotis is another area uh, if you have a stent you can use this iv 7 minute iv in the carotid and subclavian is another option so uh, there are many 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 areas where this mesentric this renal Uh, can be tackled in this subclavian artery you see a good result distal embolism going into the vertebral system or basilar system is minimal you don't have to use any protection device in carotid or brachiocephalus that's the beauty of ivl unlike your any kind of cutting device or opian balloon so opian balloon will produce lot of debris so these debris are restricted if you are using this kind of uh, so there are many examples in the femoral no no flow zone as a no stain zone uh, sfa and um, i think i should stop here and let's have some discussion thank you very much for kind listening that is a great presentation from uh, dr hazra i invite uh, comment from our chairperson and our co panelists Well, Dr. Hazra, you have really taken us through a rapid-fire session on the use of IVL in different varied situations. No doubt, it's very useful. But uh, I would like to draw your attention to sort of one point as to what would be your advice for the beginner speed as to how to choose the correct case for IVL. see ivl is not a very uh, cheap technology so once you are committed to it even if you use 10 20 pulses the cost is going to be there moreover i mean till the ivl was there we all were doing some calcific cases with reasonable amount of success i won't say that they were great results so i think we have to come out with a practical policy as to what should be our approach where we think that the ivl is perhaps the only thing that is going to work so your comments yeah so if you are a learner i mean you're just beginning your career better to start your career with ivl in 2020 straight away because the learning curve is very small second if you see a visible calcium on the chloroscopy with the trunk trunk calcification some under expanded scan because of visible calcium beyond the stain ivl is the preferred choice because this is the only and the second third is eccentric calcifications or very uh, long calcification tortuous artery and uh, difficult entry with your rota like circumflex band um, angle definitely uh, rota is not the most welcome thing because the complication rate will be very high so these are the uh, small situation like in expert hand in you i think you can do rota in any difficult situations but for the beginners when they caught with uh, in the wrong foot i think ivl should be available but in some cases as i mentioned ivl do not work like a uh, very large nodule sir uh, very large vessel and uh, nokul is uh, has joined dr uh, sorry uh, dr narendra khanna has joined i'm sure he will enlighten us on the peripheral arteries his experience and um, i think we are also learning sir with you and um, i would say it, it, not for everybody but majority and cost is definitely concerned any other remarks i welcome uh, uh, dr kanna to this uh, uh, meeting uh, dr kanna uh, before you joined uh, dr hazra was uh, uh, showing us the use of uh, ivl in uh, different situations including uh, peripheral vascular uh, uh, conditions i'm sure you have a lot to add 
uh, to this. Uh, can we go ahead with your presentation on peripheral application on shockwave lithotripsy? Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Dr. Sina. I'm, I'm sorry that uh, I joined late because of some technical internet pause. Uh, uh, so, um, is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So, Dr. Hadra has already alluded and he sort of uh, covered the entire shockwave lithotripsy uh, lecture right from uh, concepts to peripheral and coronary applications. Let me just make it simple because the time is short and I'm going to be starting with one small case, the first case which we did in the country. Uh, and this was, and I'm going to set the ball for uh, discussion. He's a 70-year-old male. My old patient had a CABG, unstable angina, native triple vessel disease, and all his saphenous vein grafts were occluded. He also had butter claudication and an ejection fraction of 25%. And this guy actually came to us with uh, you know, unstable angina and we needed to do something. When we did his, uh, uh, you know, uh, now, regarding his radials, uh, his one radial was used as a bypass for a by bypass and which had occluded right after the surgery. The other radial, uh, uh, you know, was occluded because of some previous uh, angiography procedures. Now, we were left with uh, uh, going through the groin approach. We could, uh, you know, we could uh, cannulate the ulnar and we did a shot from above. And what we saw was a very uh, heavily calcified uh, aortoiliac uh, stenosis, more on the right side. And also, this patient had a LV dysfunction. His LV EDP was around 28. We had to diarise him on the table, and we wanted to do uh, the coronary procedures. So I'm not going to be going through the details of the procedure. So the only thing we uh, thought of doing here was uh, to do a, a peripheral angioplasty first, and then put in an intraaortic balloon pump, and then go ahead and do uh, the coronary intervention, which is not a part of this discussion, so I've excluded those slides. And and then that was the time that, you know, I suddenly came to know that uh, Punita was trying to get in these peripheral catheters, and this was, uh, she just got it, and I called her. She had the sheet uh, kept on the table, uh, patient on the table, sheet uh, kept on the patient, and he recognized the patient, asked her to get uh, us the peripheral balloon as early as possible. So then uh, I'm just going to give you a little uh, uh, demonstration of what we did and uh, Dr. Hara has already alluded on this. So we used a seven millimeter lithoplasty, uh, lithotripsy balloon and you can see uh, we had to do uh, five, five or six, uh, you know, um, repeated dilatations. We used almost all the cycles. And this was a seven millimeter into 60 millimeter uh, shockwave balloon. Uh, and uh, this had a length of 110 centimeters. So after we did this, uh, we could actually get enough space and then we went ahead and uh, stented this. After we dilated, it was very easy to stent this eccentric calcium and, uh, and this uh, vessel. And then we put in a self-expanding uh, 9 millimeter into 80 millimeter stent. Uh, just from the ostium of the uh, right, uh, I mean, but I, uh, of the right common uh, iliac artery, and then we went ahead and do, did our procedures. So the, this is just to give you an example how these sort of technologies actually uh, become very, very handy, and uh, they are very safe to use, and we can go ahead and do our coronary interventions. Now, this was our first case. Of course, there was some exc excitement. We wanted to use and see how. Uh, how hard it is uh, on the on the you know soft surfaces and on the hand, and this is actually very soft on soft surfaces and hard on the hard surfaces. That means it is hard on the calcium, and and it is pretty soft on uh, any tissue, whether whether it's intima or your soft tissue. So it doesn't injure, and it is very very good for any sort of uh, uh, calcium, mostly for eccentric calcium. Now, uh, after this, uh, uh, just to give you a little uh, brief uh, of this uh, device, uh, it is actually uh, the concept is derived from uh, the lithotripsy which we do for urinary and ureteric calcium. Here, the sonic wave pressures preferably impact heart tissues and disturb calcium, leaving soft tissues undisturbed. And this was miniaturized for both coronary and peripheral applications. And uh, coronary we have discussed, and for peripheral applications, we have the same unit. It's just the catheter which is changed. Otherwise, 
uh, the unit and the uh, things are same. But the caster which we use here is uh, of diameters from 3.5 to 7 millimeter in diameter. And uh, for below knee, we have 3.5 and 4 uh, millimeter in diameter. We have a working length of 40 millimeter and a working length of 135 centimeter. And uh, in this uh, below knee application, we have maximum pulse counts of 160. And this is compatible with five French, uh, uh, you know, delivery sheet or in both of our 014 uh, guide. But for uh, above knee and entire body vasculature, we have lengths um, and diameters from 3.5 to 7. They come with a length of 60 uh, millimeter balloon length and a maximum pulse count of 300. And the guide wire again we use is 014. And they are compatible with this, the up till 6 French, it is compatible with uh, up till 6 millimeter of diameter, it is compatible with 6 French sheet. And uh, from 6 to 7, it is compatible with 7 French sheet. And here the working length is 110 uh, centimeter as opposed to 135 centimeter. And what is very uh, good for this is uh, one that it is a very quick solution for very high, hard and calcified lesions, both which could be IOTO iliac or uh, involving no stain zones like uh, the popliteal artery or the common femoral artery and sometimes even iliac bifurcation. And in high risk situations uh, where we want to avoid potential complications, like in this patient itself, the patient had very calcific, uh, uh, you know, eccentric calcium, uh, also had an ulcer there. We didn't want to actually use high pressure balloons and in fact uh, rupture that vessel and then put a covered stain. It was much easier to use this uh, shock wave lithoplasty and lithotripsy and easily go out and put a self expanding stain. It is also used when you have high risk situations like single vet vessel runoff. You have uh, when we are doing subintimal uh, angioplasty, which I do very often for uh, common uh, for the superficial femoral artery, common femoral and below knee, uh, total occlusions, long occlusions. So it is very easily used there. In fact, it works much better there than the luminal uh, angioplasty. And it is also used in the failed uh, PTA in many cases where we are not able to dilate the calcium. And this is being used, uh, where, I mean, the, one of the indications for use is to uh, actually treat the excess vessels while we are do, using large bore devices like for heavy or uh, for endovascular aortic repair. The IVL uh, is a very safe procedure. We actually uh, do it now very often and we have issues with our uh, uh, excess, the femoral excess, which are heavily calcified in the iliac excess. We have used this uh, ideal to actually break the calcium and then underline this and then put in a covered stent and uh, uh, actually get the vessel to a desired size and then go ahead and do our uh, endovascular procedure. So this is uh, actually used for large number of applications. The newer one which has not been a part of the instruction for use for us has been uh, when you have very calcified lesions in the dialysis fistula or you have occluded dialysis fistula, or you have calcified lesions in the uh, central vein, occlusions uh, in the subclavian vein and in nominate vein. Also, uh, there have been uh, reports of use in carotid arteries, but it is still out of, uh, uh, out of the indication for use as of now. And with all these, uh, uh, you know, uh, all these advantages uh, of you know, breaking the calcium, disrupting the calcium, and actually modifying the vessels to be easily dilatable and stentable. In peripheral application, there, has, there is a little bit of a, a, you know, drawback in the sense that we, the maximum size we have is only seven millimeter. And as you can see here also, we had to under, undersize the balloon here as compared to the size of the vessel, but it was adequately sized to the size of lesion. Uh, uh, most of the iliac vessels would be about nine, eight to nine millimeter in diameter and the maximum uh, diameter of this balloon which we have is uh, seven millimeter. Also, if you have calcified iota, you may have, I mean, it's a practical difficulty to use this and many a times we, we have to use two, uh, uh, you know, balloons side by side to, act, uh, side by side to actually crack the calcified lesion in the iota and uh, also, uh, if you go ahead and do the central vein again, then this is the same problem that we do not have an adequate diameter balloon. And of course, once we are doing peripherals, 
the lesions are long and they are multiple. Uh, the cost becomes a major issue here. And uh, that is why, uh, I mean, I would actually, we are looking forward that, you know, in future, maybe once the use becomes more, maybe there would be a, a reduction in the size or maybe in the cost, or maybe the company comes out with a package of per patient uh, package rather than per capita package. So I'm going to be uh, stopping here and would be very happy to take some questions. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. I have one, one question. In large diameter situations like uh, uh, Iorta, would there be a role for uh, placing two parallel uh, balloons to achieve good dilatation? Yeah, that is what I said. Uh, because we do not have a proper size balloon, that we, we tend to use uh, two balloons many a times, keeping side to side. But it's not the best thing to do, actually. The best thing is to have a circumferential, uh, you know, a calcium disruption and uh, not to keep rotating these balloons. Sir. We have used it, but that is uh, what I know. I talked to the company and the technolo technology side of the company also, but they seem they don't seem to be interested in developing that. Uh, that's diameter of the balloon as of now, maybe because of some cost consideration. And the other thing is uh, there have been some. Uh, reports of embolization and that is why the, the role in carotid uh, angioplasty although it has been used for calcified carotids uh, it uh, is still out of uh, indication for use. Thank you. Sir. Dr. Sina, any comments? Nareen, do you think there is any difference in the methodology or the intent? Instead of for veins versus arteries, I can hear that, sir. Can you please repeat? Uh, uh, I mean, is there any difference in the approach of using this technology for calcified veins versus the arterial use, which is much more prevalent? Yes, sir. I mean, uh, Actually, this is not indicated for venous use, but when we are using it for uh, dialysis fistula, we actually uh, tend to size it a little higher than the size of the vein because these veins are pretty compliant. They are not like arterial arteries, which are uh, not that compliant as veins. So we tend to lift, oversize a little. But when we are using it for uh, bigger uh, veins, like central vein, again, uh, the, there is a limitation here because we uh, don't have the adequate size and once, once we account for the compliance of the veins, the size there would be around 18 to 20 millimeter. We still can't uh, actually dilate it um, and break the calcium as we want. Secondly, we tend to use more uh, number of uh, cycles uh, per lesion in veins and also uh, in as compared to arteries because it is not that easy to uh, break the calcium in the veins as it is uh, in the arterial lesions. We do not know the reason, but that is what is our uh, sort of uh, our uh, uh, experience, and that is also shared by some other operators. Dr. Hazra, any comments, please? You're muted. Excellent presentations. And as he has mentioned, the size is an issue, definitely, with. Uh, larger diameter arteries, but um, you know, the, as he was mentioning that even seven millimeter IVL did work for his large bore access of the device. So for impella or Parkinson's alvad or difficult taver, when you go for alternate access, is a kind of alternate to alternate access. I mean, you, you, rather than going into subclavian, you can always come back with even seven millimeter IVL can give some kind of lumen where the entry of this large bus device uh, can be done without much disruptions or any fear of perforations or intimal uh, peeling off. I mean, those kind of advantage is there even with seven millimeter, but definitely should look for larger size. Thank you, sir. Dr. Aftar, any comment from you, sir? We can move on to the next presentation. Yeah. We, we can move to the next. Sir. Next case by uh, Dr. Bikash Majumdar from Kolkata. Use of IVL in an otherwise non-dilatable LED lesion. I'm sorry if my introduction goes wrong. Dr. Hadra, I, I, I know you are in Kolkata, but I don't know why the 
uh, introduction they gave me that uh, gawati and i kept it's wondering okay. it's okay i don't i don't I, deserve uh, we are very apologetic sir i think some typo or we are very apologetic it's okay go ahead go ahead i'm not dr that hajra and dr shetty both sir i'm very very sorry no, no, no. dr majumdar please good afternoon seems to be some network issue it looks like click on presentation sir click on the presentation yeah now we can hear you but click on the presentation yes <laughs> i don't know why i am showing in the screen you have to click on the presentation uh, sir uh, while selecting your share uh, once you select share you select this slides your presentation sir because you are selecting doctor uh, the 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 show which is going on hence dr shetty is being shown here on the screen can you please uh, or we can uh, as you can have dr ayan kar sir in the meantime in the yes meantime. yes 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 yeah uh, one of somebody assist dr majumdar with his uh, presentation in the meantime we invite dr okay. ayan from yeah. narayana vidyalaya kolkata sir. to make his presentation uh, good evening sir i'll just uh, somebody is still sharing his slides i am not able to share till that person stops dr. sharing dr majumdar you will have to exit screen sharing uh, uh, the support team can do this uh, support team support team can you do that sorry sir can you come again hey, can you un, uh, unshare uh, dr vikash majumdar for time being yeah just give me a minute sir ha uh, uh, try and karo do that okay i'm still not able to show my slides sir it's still Yeah, yeah, just 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 a sec, sir. Just a sec. Uh, the support team is doing it, so it will be just. So now, now you can try. You, now you can go ahead, sir. Now you can go ahead and do it, sir. Now you can share your screen, sir. After, after, we will talk in the meeting. Hello. Hi. Uh, you can share it now, sir. You can share it. Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll just. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, it's a very good afternoon to everybody, and. Uh, i mean i'm probably uh, bringing up the rear end of some really power packed presentations and uh, possibly we've had really good cases to show so i will show you something that uh, we are kind of new to intravascular lithotripsy as far as uh, we are concerned and uh, we have very eminent uh, faculties uh, chairpersons and moderators so and, dr uh, I, dr ayan sorry to interrupt you i will request you to put your slides on slide mode option because 
yeah on yeah, the yeah, full yeah, screen yeah i'll do that i'll do that i'm sorry i'm sorry i'll do that can you see is that okay now yeah okay so uh, thank you for uh, this great opportunity to present in front of uh, so many eminent personalities moderators chairpersons and uh, uh, and doctors we've always looked up to dr hajra has been uh, a tremendous source of inspiration and he actually uh, has already shown whatever has to be shown about intravascular lithotripsy so let me tell you about my little case and uh, we are talking about a 66 year old hypertensive male uh, he was a known case of ckd as you know most of these patients tend to have a lot of calcific coronary artery disease he presented to our emergency department with unstable angina tropi of 12 baseline hemoglobins of 12.5 and he has a creat of 8.4 and he's dialysis dependent so that is the initial uh, look and uh, so he had been on a, a optimal antianginal therapy for the last 4 to 5 months and despite that he's been having uh, very significant episodes of chest pain and as you can see that is a dominant circ with a, a discrete calcific lesion exactly somewhere around here as you can see and there is some uh, calcium out here also in the lad so his rc was non dominant with only 60 to 70% now let me just go ahead and show you our areas of interest from the intravascular imaging so if you can see out here the distal landing zone also has a nice bright calcium out here with the mla of 5.41 and uh, that is uh, somewhere close to the tightest part of the uh, lesion and that has a mla of about 4.37 and you can see concentric calcium almost all around it's more than a 270 degree arc and as you can see here also approximately in the l6 also there's a quite amount of disease out here with a lot of calcium and uh, so we initially started out with uh, the standard 2.5 into 50 non compliant balloon and as we were starting to inflate the balloon there was a lot of dog boning you can see that little waste out there and let me show you how that looked once we took a shot uh, and with that you can see that there's a significant stenosis out there with that balloon in place so we did a little bit more pre dilatation it appeared to give a little way but still there was quite significant amount of waste and uh, as you know the, it this kind of lesion requires some amount of lark preparation and that would be in the form of uh, uh, calcium debulking and uh, given the fact that this is uh, we saw the calcium out there it's a concentric calcium and significant amount of calcium about including almost approximate part of the l6 and would uh, generally uh, uh, be uh, amenable to intravascular lithotripsy so we decided to go ahead and use the intravascular lithotripsy balloon uh, at four atmospheres three cycles of 10 pulses each were deployed out here and uh, so this was a 3 mm balloon which we used and once it was at four atmosphere with good apposition to the walls we gave three cycles of 10 pulses each and as uh, dr hajra said that you can see the air bubble inside the balloon and as well as if you look very closely there are two lithotripsy emitters in the middle of the balloon which i think is not so clear here but uh, in the angio interface it's generally very well seen so i won't take you through the procedural steps of ivl i think that is something has been reiterated more than once uh, in the uh, previous presentations presented before me so let me take you to the pictures which were post uh, ivl and as you can see here uh, we have been able to do a good job and uh, so that that's uh, so the ivl balloon expanded to six atmospheres and we do not have a waste and that is a shoot after the ivl uh, expansion and as you can see it's a good expansion we do not have much waste and we have good luminal gains out here so of course you can see the pre and post uh, ivl there's marked difference so that was pre ivl and this is post ivl so definitely we've made a quite significant luminal gain and now finally the vessel is nice and compliant and it, it's in a good position to take a stent so so as you can see although the fractures are not as well appreciated on intravascular uh, ultrasound as it is on oct we saw some fantastic images shown by uh, dr aftab khan where you know we had nice uh, fractures seen in the uh, in the uh, concentric deep calciums but here also i think there were some uh, fractures made and as you can see what's important is the luminal gain that we see pre and post ivl so post ivl expansion as you can see uh, we've done uh, we've again taken a 3 uh, 3.5 balloon now and we've nicely dilated up and there is no waste anymore out here and let me show you the shoot out here so we've again have a nice place right now to put in a stent so we've taken a 26 mm uh, stent uh, and deployed it at 11 atmospheres nicely deployed we do not have any dog boning anywhere 
and post dilatation done with a 3.5 into 15. We went up to pressures of 18 to 20 to ensure there's good apposition of the stent. And yes, of course, those are the final irises from uh, the uh, from the LCX. And as you can see, we put nice apposition out here, good luminal gains, and our final gains at the tightest part has gone up to nine uh, nine point square in the proximal LCX. And so let me show you the final IVUS results. So we really hope this patient is going to be uh, doing really well in the long term. And that is the whole idea of uh, doing intravascular uh, lithotripsy in these patients. And as you can see, it's a very large dominant cirque. And so definitely it should take care of the ischemic burden too. So the take home from my cases was that it definitely works in concentric, intimal and medial calcium where rotablation is not effective. Now, the most reasons are that rotablation burrs are technically sized up to 2.5. And sometimes the burrs, are, in these cases, the superficial and deep calcium, the rotablation basically chips off mostly the superficial calcium and not the deep. And as you can see here, one catheter can deliver up to 80 pulses, which seems to be quite adequate even for uh, reasonably long lesions. And once the catheter is positioned across the lesion, your chance of success is very high. So it is important that we get the IVL catheter across the lesion, which needs to be debulked. Now, one of the cons that we that uh, I think Dr. Nokulsen has already expressed and reiterated over and over again is something that it is an expensive uh, uh, hardware to have in the cath lab, and it of course not something that uh, almost all our patients can afford. And then, of course, the expanded balloon is sometimes difficult to visualize because of uh, the dye to contrast. I mean, dye to dye to saline ratio that we use in these kind of patients. And of course, there is that issue about the large crossing profile of this balloon, which is about, to, oh, I think it's 0.043 to 0.046, depending on the size of the balloon that you are taking. Hence, it would be difficult to deploy in very critical lesions. So of course, uh, there you would want to use more complementary therapies like rotablation, et cetera, to make way for the IVL balloon. Thank you. Very, very elegant result, Dr. Kerr. Thank you, sir. Why did you have a temporary pacer in for this patient? Uh, yeah, we did have a temporary pacer inside. Uh, we just because it was a dominant cirque that we were working in and we were occluding it right at the proximal part. So, I mean, just for safety, it was kept in the IVC. We didn't put it into the RV, but just ensure that in case we need it, uh, it was there. Any comments from the chairperson or my co-panelists? If there are no uh, no more uh, comments, we'll go on to the uh, next presentation. Thank you, Dr. Kar. Uh, Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, is Dr. Majumdar ready with the presentation? Can you hear me now? Yes, 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 yes. Now I'm sharing. Out in class. Because can you see my screen? Yes, yes, sir. Right. So my case is very simple case. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you, chairperson and the other panelists. It's a very simple case. Uh, it's a 65-year-old gentleman presented with acute shortness of breath with chest discomfort. And he had a background history of diabetes mellitus and chronic renal failure, and he was on dialysis. Clinically, he was on pulmonary edema, and ECG showed complete heart block, and there was elevated HS troponin I. So initial management, he had a temporary pacing were inserted, and the heart failure was treated with IVGTN and hemodialysis. Dual antiplatelet was given, and once stabilized, he underwent a dual chamber pacemaker implantation and a coronary angiography. And uh, coronary angiography revealed a CTO of the distal right coronary artery. There was calcified 70 to 80% stenosis of the proximal RCA. And LED showed a calcified 80% stenosis. Circumflex also had a 60% stenosis at the proximal vessel. At the first instance, I did the distal RCA CTO and the proximal RCA lesion was tented. I'm not going to show that uh, angioplasty at this moment with QDS. 
and the LED angioplasty was contemplated on a separate setting. So this is an LED angiogram. You can appreciate. It's a very probably a simplistic looking lesion here. There are some calcium. If you look at the angiography, there are some calcium around it. So I went uh, right radial, put the wear in, and started predilating this lesion with 3 into 12 NC traveler balloon. And you can see at 20 atmosphere, there is top warning. So, of course, definitely this NC traveler is not going to work here. So, next stage, what we could do? So, next, I took a cutting balloon because as NC is not working properly. I took a 3 to 8 millimeter flex stone, and even at 14 atmosphere, it is dog boning as well and not giving me the result that I was expecting. So definitely, though the lesion looked very innocuous, but the calcium load of this lesion is particularly is troublesome and it's not allowing me to dilate the lesion adequately. So I can't really put a stent without having proper uh, pre-dilatation of this particular lesion. And I took then an Aquaforce NC balloon, again, 3 into 8, went up to 24 atmosphere, and in spite of that, there is a dog pony. So at this stage, so we took an Aquaforce, we took a flex dome, it didn't work. So in my shelf, I had an OPN balloon. So next stage, I took an OPN balloon, and I went to the 40 atmosphere with the OPN, and you see that OPN rupture with, again, a dog pony in the OPN. So this showed that serially I started with an NC, then went up to the flex stone in the very high pressure with an Aquaforce NC to 24. And all these attempt failed. I took an OPN balloon and that too also ruptured at 40, 40 atmospheric pressure. So at that point, moment of time, I thought, okay, I need to have a IVL in this case because this is a stubborn calcium which is causing the problem. And uh, I didn't have an imaging here because you can imagine that I've already spent a lot of money doing a CTO on the right coronary artery, putting two stents, and the uh, right lesion also was uh, tough. So I had to use a lot of balloon and flex stones on the right as well. And this uh, left, so I had to use an IVL. So I couldn't have the afford to have another OCT in this particular case. So I do not have the luxury to show you the OCT, which would have been better if I could. So then uh, I went for an IVL, and this is a 3.5 kind of vessel. So I took a 3.5 IVL, 3.5 into 12, and you see after the first uh, 10 pulse, this is after the 20 pulse, it looks a little bit better. And this is 30 pulse, still a little bit of dog boning there. And after 40 pulse, I'm relatively happy with the predilatation. And then if you look at the angiography after the IVL, the lesion looks much better than what it was before the IVL. Then it was very easy. I stated with 3.5 into 22 millimeter resolute onyx at 12 atmospheric pressure. You can see that stent has expanded nicely after this IVL dilatation and this is a stain boost with post stenting you can see that stain boost is showing a nice dilatation nice uh, you know stent expansion and then post dilated with 3.75 into 10 millimeter nc balloon at 18 atmosphere and it is a post you know stain boost after the post dilatation it shows nice uh, stent position and the final angiographic result. So this is an example, I am just showing, it's a very simple case, an example of a severely calcified lesion, which was otherwise non-dilatable non with an NC, with a flex stone, and even with a OPN balloon, but successfully the lesion was prepared with the use of IVL and successfully stent was implanted. So that was the purpose of showing this particular case. Uh, it's uh, thank you very much for your patience here. Thank you, sir, for a great case. Good demonstration of how traditional options of uh, balloon-based uh, lesion preparation 
fail and then i will make a big difference in uh, such situations without the complexities of uh, road ablation so your case was definitely worth waiting for thank you so much sir dr hazara any comments from your side yeah i mean uh, it's lucky that uh, that i will work if i will did not work perhaps uh, he had to take help of rota or uh, orbital aspect for me uh, again uh, orbital is not available but definitely as professor sina was mentioning the age old rota uh, does uh, does uh, work wonder in this kind of calcium because it was a kind of concentric calcium patients and uh, you may see a failure as i was sh showing a proximal led where ivl fails you take rota rota shock or your rota fails you take then uh, rota shocks with your uh, alternate uh, therapy but in this case it has worked and definitely it will gain the more msa and the long term outcome will be better so these are the usual garden variety cases you should try initial idea so in this particular case just uh, i i took a seven french seven french guide to uh, do this case because i had a feeling that it is a sequel of calcium so there may be a possibility that might you know that ivl will not even get ruptured or something happens so i may have to go with rota bar uh, so i had the rota in the back of my mind even i used uh, ivl in this particular case so yes if ivl didn't work then i could have to rota it and then do it ivl once more i think this is uh, also one case where perhaps if imaging had been done beforehand you would have been more sure that you would need the ivl and just go ahead and do it because you took uh, you had to do a lot of hard work try flex to mc balloons and then ruptured opn before you took the decision to do the ivl so i think all said and done just a simple i was pass which takes in 5 minutes and possibly delineate the useful uh, cases where it could make for a much shorter procedure at time I, i agree with you and i wish i would have done it uh, the reason i was a little bit continuous uh, you are right everybody of us passes through that phase and we become wiser after that but i think yeah. as time passes we will come to an algorithm just doing a short ivs run will probably give us much more idea as to which modality is going to be of benefit to us yeah initially because when i did the right coronary artery the right also had a calcified proximal lesion which i managed to with a flex stone so i was probably a little bit overconfident thinking that okay the right was managed with the flex stone flex stone and that that lesion actually looked much worse uh, angiographically than what this uh, lre lesion is looking and um, that i thought okay i, I was successful i was successful with the road uh, flex stone on the right so i will probably be successful with the flex stone on the left so that was my assumption but i was i was wrong so that's why i was wrong. dr khanna dr khanna uh, i want to ask one question here uh, do you use ivers for uh, you have mentioned about the dialysis line for dvts these dvts are have very peculiar kind of uh, napkin ring kind of uh, veins where it's very difficult to dilate with the balloon so do you see any ivs and ivl or is it mandated to have ivs then ivl or you can straight away go with ivl in dvts and there are two things we are talking about if you are mm -hmm. talking of deep vein thrombosis uh, normally uh, the most common place where we have this stenosis is uh, left common iliac artery uh, vein Uh, it is called as Mayer-Turner uh, syndrome, where it's the compression or stenosis of the left common iliac vein when the right common iliac artery crosses over that. It is very, very, very difficult to find that out or you know appreciate that on an angio. You have some signs. The best way to do that is through an intravascular ultrasound because normally there are webs or there are rings which are not visible on a two-dimensional uh, angiography, and uh, the intravascular ultrasound is very important there and i don't think uh, ivl is important there because that's not the place where a lot of calcium is usually present on the venous side the calcium is usually present when the veins uh, undergo a very high pressure flow and you know a damage because of pressure uh, which they are not supposed to be handling and that happens in a dialysis fistula or it happens in the central vein Uh, when the where the dialysis uh, i mean the arterialized uh, vein venous flow actually drains 
and uh, many a times you have a catheter pre-op catheter placement sent uh, into those veins for dialysis. As it is, those veins are damaged or they are uh, they have fibrosis or just you know to start with. So only on those two places we have high uh, calcium, and I believe. Uh, there, uh, the IVS may not be very much required because those are so superficial and the calcium is very easily visible on the fluoroscopy or, and, and also on the stent boost. So I don't think the IVS may be of use there, but IVS is of very important use in medical. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, all of you, for great presentation. And I thank uh, the chairpersons, uh, Dr. Nakul Sina and Dr. Narendra Kanna for their uh, uh, valuable inputs. And I also thank all the uh, esteemed uh, panelists. And uh, I uh, request uh, uh, Esan to make the closing remarks. Uh, th thank you once again, sir. It was a pleasure and honor to have all of you uh, this evening to get an esteemed panel of this nature is an honor to be an organization, sir. We thank you on the behalf of all the doctors and the viewers. We had about uh, for this session, we had 230 viewers uh, at this point of time, just to be informed, looking at the fact that today is Saturday and looking at the fact that APSIC is going on and looking at the fact that there is an international conference in the, in the night, I think it was a very, very good uh, audience coming in uh, all over the country. Uh, and simultaneously, various other similar conferences going in this country today. Uh, I think it was a great pleasure to have all of you, the entire chair, the chair and the moderators and the panelists and all the speakers and thanks to the audience right there sir thank you very much i think we are already sure. have uh, these speakers for the next session sir thank you sir um, you can uh, exit as per your convenience sir thank you it's a pleasure thank you dr Sri. thank you thank you very much thank you dr sina all right